30 years in this industry. Yeah, man, you know, it's funny. So my son, my youngest son is 14 now. That's how old I was when I started. You know, I'm 44 now, I look at him, and I think all the things that were going on around me at that time and what it was like starting, and now I can't imagine that, that that's what happened. But at the time, it felt very natural, and it felt very safe, even though it was not. You know what I mean? But I'm, I'm just grateful, man, like, to be able to do something like this for 30 years. I, I gotta be one of the luckiest people alive, man. Like, I, I don't know that I've ever really had a, any other job. How old were you when you made your first TV development deal? 19. My mother and my grandmother were freaked out. You know, I was the first person in my family not to go to college that had not been a slave. Right. <laughs> so I was really breaking from tradition. And uh, it was like a graduation lunch we were having. And they had my dad come and talk to me, and my dad takes me outside and he's like, listen, and this is some advice that applies to all you acting students. He says, to be an actor is a lonely life. Everybody wants to make it and you might not make it. And I said to my dad, well, well that depends on what making it is there. He was a smart, smart ass kid. Yeah. It depends on what making it is there. He says, what do you mean? I said, well, you're a teacher. I said, if I can make a teacher salary doing comedy, I think that's better than being a teacher. And he started laughing. He said, if you keep that attitude, I think you should go. He said, but name your price in the beginning. If it ever gets more expensive than the price you name, get out of there. Mm -hmm. Thus, Africa. <laughs> When Martin Lawrence was in that chair, we talked about Blue Streak. I love that too. He played a role in your life, I believe. How do you feel about him as a person, as an artist? Martin Lawrence is the guy that showed everybody you can make it from D.C. to Hollywood. And uh, I had a personal stake in his success. Every time he did something, it made me feel inspired and really good. And he was always real nice to me. He'd sit me down, what's going on with you, baby boy? What, what? We'd talk about comedy, whatever. And, uh, you know, when we did Blue Streak, we were promoting it, you know, and Martin had a stroke. He almost died. And then after that, I saw him, and I was like, oh, my God, Martin, are you okay? And he said, I got the best sleep I ever got in my life. <laughs> That's how tough he is. So let me ask you this. What is happening in Hollywood that a guy that tough will be on the street waving a gun, screaming, they are trying to kill me. Yeah. What's going on? Why is Dave Chappelle going to Africa? Why does Mariah Carey make a $100 million deal and take clothes off on TRL? It, a weak person cannot get to sit here and talk to you. Ain't no weak people talking to you. So what is happening in Hollywood? Nobody knows. The worst thing to call somebody is crazy, is dismissive. I don't understand this person, so they're crazy. That's bullshit. These people are not crazy. They're strong people. Maybe the environment is a little sick. You know, in the past, I used to always tell a lot of jokes about white people. And I know there's a lot of white people here with us tonight. Good evening, whites. Everybody knows what it's like to be embarrassed or to be feel marginalized. The implication is authority. Nobody likes authority figures. When I say jokes about white people, don't think for a second that I'm talking about you. Don't forget, I almost had $50 million once. When you make enough money in America, they'll pull back the curtain and introduce you to the real white people. You guys just think you're white. Dave Chappelle.
is very intelligent. He's well raised. That goes without saying. A person who is well raised knows to to respect the elders. It doesn't mean that you have to agree with anything, even a little bit of what the elder says, but you respect the elder for surviving. It's so much bigger than money, though, Dave. It's so much bigger than money. Oh, no, it was bigger than money. But you know what? I, I watched one of these nature shows one time, and they were talking about how a bushman finds water when it's scarce. And they do what's called a salt trap. I, I, I didn't know this. Apparently, baboons love salt. OK. So they put a lump of salt in a hole, and they wait for the baboon. The baboon comes, sticks his hand in the hole, grabs the salt. Salt makes his hand bigger, and he's trapped. He can't get his hand out. Now, if he's smart, all he does is let go of the salt. Baboon doesn't want to let go of the salt. Then the bushman just comes, takes the baboon, throws him in the cage, and gives him all the salt he wants. And then the baboon gets thirsty. The bushman lets him out of the cage. The first place the baboon runs to is water. Bushman follows him, and they both drink to their fill. And in that analogy, I felt like the baboon. But I was smart enough to let go of the song. Well, veteran of comedy, people look to you to kind of clear the fog that we as Americans go through. Do you, I know you take that seriously, but is that a big burden on you, that people look to you for clarity? They look for you for truth? I think that it's a symptom of just how maybe bankrupt our society is right now, that, we, that we're looking to our entertainers for this type of guidance. But when things are obscure, artists do try to tell the truth. Sometimes it's not like they're looking for the truth. Sometimes they just want to hear their truth come out of somebody else. Like, why don't, you know what I mean? So I don't, I don't look at it as a burden or I don't even look at it as a responsibility. I just think it's the nature of the genre. And I think that one of the things that's special about our genre in this day and age is that it's very engaging, it's very personal. And I think in this cyberspace world that people need an entertainer that looks them in the eyes and says the things that they, they feel. For all the things that I've done, I'm most renowned for what I didn't do. I, I've made decisions in my career that a lot of people have called insane. 2004, had a $50 million deal on the table, and in a crisis of conscience, flipped the table over and walked away. Went to South Africa. Everyone said I was running away from the money. That is not true. In fact, I still want that money. <laughs> <laughs> the idea that I wanted to just share with you guys is the idea that sometimes you you do what you think is best, uh, whether anybody understands it or not. I heard a story about my father where someone told me he used to do statistics for a company in D.C. The company he did statistics for started doing business with the South African government, so he quit his job. It's caused a lot of problems between his, him and his wife. It's hard for a man when he can't provide for his family the way he wants to. And he suffered through it. And a generation later, when I had my crisis of conscience, I was able to go to a free South Africa and get away from the heat. This idea that what you do in your lifetime informs the generations that comes after you is something I keep thinking about, something that is so much bigger than just ourselves. I just want, I just want, I just want you guys to remember, you know, that right now there's this thing where where ethics aren't what they used to be. This idea that people are trying to replace the ideas of good and bad with better or worse. And that is incorrect. You got to keep your ethics intact because uh, good and bad is a compass that helps you find the way. And a person that only does what's better or worse is the easiest type of person to control. They are a mouse in a maze that just finds the cheese. But the one who knows about good and bad will realize that he's in a maze. This is my last question for you. You don't do many sit-down TV interviews. Why is that? Because, because so much of an answer depends on how you feel any given day. But it lives forever. 
that your opinions about things can change, your view of yourself can change, and yet this is on a permanent record. Like Donald Trump, he complains about it because someone can look at him and say, well, you said in 1984 that this, that, or the other, and, and that's the cross you have to bear when you engage the press. And more important than that, I talk for a living, so I don't want to blather about me blathering. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just want to, I'd rather just do it. Well, this has been fucking wonderful. <laughs> I don't know what to say, man. I don't even want this night to end. I promise you, whoever cares the most, I care at least as much as them. I know what I got, because I lost it all. I got to tell you something, and I don't talk about it often. Have you ever worked all your life for something and have it not work out? Yeah. That happened to me. It was tough. Think about it. I was gone for 12 years. It's not a little bit of time. It was hell. I watched other niggas that I knew become very famous. I watched the world go on without me. I mourned the loss of it. And after a while, I didn't care. Coming back was terrifying. I understand what I am. I really do more than anybody. Like when they write about me in history, I'll, I'll be dead reading it like, yeah, I know they'd say that. <laughs> they say that a person can't dream of a face they've never seen. Can't believe that's true, but it's probably true. Boy, I got a long bank of faces. 32 years, I could close my eyes, I could think of any night, there's so many faces, every night, most nights, they're all looking up, smiling. <laughs> you have no idea what the world looks like from that. All different races, all different colors, all different kind of beliefs, just looking at me, smiling for 32 years, night after night. <sighs> <laughs> no comedian take that for granted. I swear to God, this might be the noblest of professions. Robin Williams had a bar that I loved. He said, comedy is the only job you can have where you can use everything you know. And that's true. You can use more than you know. You can use what you think. Use it. Don't be afraid. Don't let these bitch ass niggas button your lip. <laughs> Say it anyway. first became aware of Dave Chappelle right around before the first study professor, because I was supposed to play that role that he played. And then I kind of saw him, and I was like, hey, that guy right, that kid, that kid would be funny playing that role. I try to be people, but now it's time for Reggie to karateize your way. Woo! Dave is so much smarter than everyone. Like, Dave is one of the most, maybe the most intellectual comedian ever. It took us 400 years to figure out as a people that white people's weakness the whole time was kneeling during their national anthem. <laughs> That's a brittle spirit. That's right, nigga. On the rock, it's regular. Ah! Ah! What are you doing, nigga? Stand up! He stretched the art form and uh, his impact on the culture. He is the voice of his generation without question. Nobody's even close to him. No, I've had to learn. And that's where um, Dave Chappelle was, um, has been a wonderful friend and mentor. What did Chappelle say to you that helped you with that? Chappelle said to me, we were, we were um, doing a show at uh, Radio City together. It was during his run. Right. And I was, on, I was on one of the shows and he said to me, I said, man, I, like, what am I going to tell these? Because I was like, I'm going to do comedy before Dave Chappelle. I was like, Dave, oh. what am I even doing here? <laughs> and Dave That's said, great. and I said, I don't even know if I'm funny enough to be here. I said, you're nice. And I think I'm a really funny guy, but what am I doing here? And Dave said, look, man. He said, you don't understand something. He said, you're not here because you're funny. He says, I know a hundred funny motherfuckers out there. 
He said, you're here because you're interesting. And he said, anyone can be funny. Not everybody can be interesting. Not everyone can make an audience listen to what they're saying. Not everyone has a wealth of life experience that makes people want to know what they have in their minds. And so that changed my perspective on silence. And so now if I can hear that an audience is listening, I'm engaged. Well, that is a great piece of advice, not only for comics, but for, for anybody. Right. Because, wow, the thing that I love about Chappelle, and you just identified it, is he will go. He's interesting. And he is an interesting he's the guy. Most, he's the most interesting man I've ever met. That's, that's, yeah, that's what makes Dave Chappelle. People, many people are funny. There's a lot of funny stand-up comedians all over the world. Yes. But what makes Dave Chappelle Dave Chappelle is that he is interesting it's how he sees the world between the jokes but all jokes aside ken spacey shouldn't have done that shit to that kid he's 14 years old and was forced to carry a grown man's secret for 30 years jesus christ he must have been busting at the seams with that one the saddest part is if he were able to carry that secret for six more months I will get to know how House of Cards ends. <laughs> I loved was, um, I can't believe that I've been in this business long enough that we're like the older guys now. And it always blows my mind that I'm like five years older than Dave Chappelle because he was already a made guy when I came in. So I always look at him like he's got 10 years on me. You know, or 15. And, you know, just when I watch his act, I'm like, this guy's clearly been doing this a good couple of decades longer than me. And the reality is I think he's only been doing it like six years longer than I have or something like that. He's fucking amazing. And what I love, too, is just he's that same. Um, with all that's changed, everybody getting offended, all of this fucking crap, how you get in trouble. He hasn't changed at all. He's just like that same guy that I saw way back in the day when I used to go to the Boston Comedy Club and watch him go on at like two in the morning and just start murdering at two in the fucking morning. And I remember he's always sit there going, how, the, how do you do that? How do you get that funny at two in the morning in front of a crowd that gave up on the show like an hour ago and they're tired and they just want to go home? That second he steps on stage, boom, he just like, he just starts fucking killing Dave's a beast. Dave's a beast, man. That's the only man. Only man that puts a little fear in my heart. I'm like, okay. It's real. What's he doing? Do you watch him? Do you oh, watch totally. him? Totally. You study. Totally. Totally. I got the I got I got Chappelle. I got an app. I follow him. I'm like, you know, my man P Prince Paul always says, competition keeps you in condition. True. You know? So yeah, that's that's my man right there. The other real special shout out I gotta make. Because none of this would have been possible on any level uh, without this person is my mother. Mom. My mother. Mom, 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 mom. You have no idea what I put this woman through. <laughs> if you had just given birth to me, that would have been more than enough. But the fact that she raised me and raised me well we had a real oral tradition in our house. I knew the word griot when I was a little boy. A griot was a person in Africa who was charged with keeping the stories of the village. Everyone would tell a griot the stories and they would remember them all so that they could tell future generations. And when they got old, they'd tell them to someone else. And they say in Africa, when a griot dies, it's like a library was burnt down. And my mother used to tell me, before I ever thought about doing comedy, she said, you should be a griot. And she'd fill me with every story of black life. You know, she's educated in African-American studies. And she would let me understand the context that I was being raised in, that I'm being raised in a hostile environment that I have to tame. By the time I was 14 years old, I was in nightclubs, mastering an adult world. It was terrifying. Crack epidemic was going on, and my mother would hear gunshots outside and be scared to death. Maybe it's my son. But early in my career, if you remember, Mom, you used to sit in the club with me. She'd do a full day of work. You'd be back there falling asleep just waiting for me to go on. She would watch my show every night. Do you know how long that car ride is home?
How many of you have ever heard your mother say, pussy jokes were a little too much tonight, son? <laughs> I was a soft kid. I was sensitive, I'd cry easy, and I would be scared to fist fight. And my mother used to tell me this thing, I don't even know if you remember, but you said this to me more than once. You said, son, sometimes you have to be a lion so you can be the lamb you really are. I talk this shit like a lion. I'm not afraid of any of you when it comes word to word. I will gab with the best of them just so I can chill and be me. And that's why I love my art form, because I understand every practitioner of it. Whether I agree with them or not, I know where they're coming from. They want to be heard. They got something to say. There's something they notice. They just want to be understood. Love this genre. It saved my life. 